having me. I'm excited to be here. Let's, let's start off with just a hello. Okay, thank you. Usually I have to say, let's try that one more time, but you guys were pretty good there. Um, I'd like everybody to take out a piece of paper that they don't want to keep, please. Take out a piece of paper that they don't, you don't want to keep, and a pen, and if somebody has a yellow legal pad at your table, have them give you a sheet of paper. <clears throat> okay, so get a pen. If you don't have a pen, pull one out. Anybody need paper or pen? Raise your hand if you need paper or pen. Okay. So now what I want you to do is I want a, you to look across the table, make eye contact with the person that's across the table from you, wave and say hello. Now I want you to draw a picture of them. Okay? And you've got two minutes to do that. So go ahead and draw a picture of your neighbor. Okay, okay, this is my favorite part of giving a talk, when I've got the audience so excited I can't even get their attention back. But I want you to take a, 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 just a moment to reflect how the room felt there, how the room felt there, and how it's going to feel different when I'm just standing up here talking, and just giving you the experience of what an interactive classroom can feel like without it even being relevant necessarily or you knowing the relevancy of what, what you're doing. But I'm going to share that with you right now. I heard a lot of people say, uh, you're prettier than this. Um, or I saw some people crinkling up their paper. I heard a number of, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I saw a person here whose head was down on her table and she was laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Right? Okay. So, so what I want to point out here is that learning can and should be fun, okay? But also, you know, we need to sometimes try things and then even if we don't know how to do it or we're not good at it or we're not, you know, trained in a particular, uh, in a particular task, we can still try and then know that we can just scrap it if, it's, uh, if it doesn't work out. Okay, and so as you're trying on new pedagogies and new ways of teaching that are different from how you were taught, okay, anybody ever wonder, uh, why do I have to teach this way? I learned from a person standing up at the room, lecturing to me for four years, and then for another five or six, or maybe if you're me, seven, for your doctorate. So why do I need to teach interactively? Does any, anybody ever wonder that? Right? Okay, so you wonder that. Other folks know it's a gamed question, so they're not willing to raise their hands, right? But I'd like to, s to remind you that you're maybe 2 or 3 percent of the population, okay? 2 to 3 percent of people have PhDs or doctorates. And we learned in spite of the way we were taught, not necessarily because of the way we were taught, okay? And our kids are not mini us's as much as we'd like them to be. So what we're going to be talking about today is how to help your students learn in ways that are aligned with, science, with the science of learning. And we're going to, I'm going to ask you to try things that you maybe haven't tried before, that you might not be comfortable with. But have fun and smile and do it. Is it. My favorite thing I just saw was this gentleman back here who actually folded up his paper so no one else could see it as he passed it across the table. <laughs> he said he was sorry, okay? So I just want to invite you to have some fun as we move along today. And I'm going to start off by seeing if I can get this to work here. I want you to think of something that you know that you're really good at, or something that you know really well, okay? And write that down on, on your paper. On your engaged boot camp site, and, and also, just for your information, all of these slides will be available. If you go to the 
flipped classroom, and then click on active learning outcomes, you'll see the first, uh, if you click on active learning, sorry, just click on active learning on the left hand side, you'll see that the first poll is called uh, active learning intro. And I want you to choose the response that matches most closely with how you learned that something. Not one person picked lecture, okay? The most popular response was what, Sam? Uh, C, trial and error. Trial and error was 57%. Okay, and what about something else? Uh, 10%. So 10% of you said something else, but the large majority was either practicing, trial and error, or what was the third one? Yeah, okay. observing, someone. observing someone else, okay? So, but what is the whole of education based on? Lecture. I'm gonna skip around here. So this is what a typical classroom looks like. In fact, um, I love this picture. I took this picture at Harvard. This is a Harvard professor. Yeah, given a, given a lecture. And what do you see happening in this classroom? The students are in a cage. A chicken coop. He's got his back to them. Okay. And where's the, where's the engagement? Pen to paper. It's yet to come. It could be happening. In the brain. Okay. Let's look back at the oldest depiction of a classroom and what learning and teaching is supposed to look like. Okay, this is the school at Athens. And we've got Socrates and Aristotle here. What kinds of things do we see going on in this classroom? <laughs> Texting. <laughs> Groups, group learning. Slovenliness. Man, you guys must be tired. I've never had an onion say so much lazy, slovenliness, <laughs> sleeping. <clears throat> what else do we see going on? Some individual thinking, right? This is actually Pythagoras right here. Okay, he's thinking a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So when we're talking about a flipped classroom, this is the kind of learning, or an active learning classroom, this is the kind of learning that we're trying to develop for our students. This is my classroom, and these students, I know that you may think that this picture is posed. These students are taking a test. Okay, this is a, this is a test. I'm going around. They're trying to convince each other of what the answer is because it's a collaborative test. And this is the kind of engagement that I like to see in my own classroom. But that doesn't mean that you have to be doing this 24-7, that they're always, it always has to look like this. Okay? <clears throat> Throughout this workshop, what I'm hoping that you'll be able to do, what the outcomes for this workshop are, that you'll be able to explain the basic framework for an effective flipped classroom in a way that you can customize to work either with or without technology for you and your students. And then simply, I hope you'll be able to identify effective strategies for maximizing learning during class, after class, and before class. Okay, so you've all probably heard this idea about flipped classrooms and, and you think it's a fad. It kind of is. The word's a fad. People have been flipping their classrooms at least since the 1800s when Christopher Columbus Langdell developed the case study method at Harvard in the law school. So what's the case study method? Any lawyers? Right. So what he did is he had students reading the cases before coming to class, and what do they do during class time? Right, and there's a very specific method that's used in law. Socratic method, it's cold calling. It's cold calling, okay? <clears throat> the students come in, <clears throat> they know that they could be cold called at any moment, so they do their work. They do their out-of-class work because they don't want to be embarrassed in front of their law professors. 
Too bad all of our students don't have that same motivation. Okay, but the, I, this idea of a flipped classroom, it's not a new thing. It's just a fad name. It's something that's been done for over a century. And any humanities instructors in here that say, have students do reading before class and then do deep learning in class, are you like, okay, yeah, I've been doing that forever. This isn't new. That's true. This is not a new thing. It's just a new word for things that you've already been doing, most of you have already been doing. Well, let's talk about what a true flipped classroom should really look like. First is that students prepare to participate for in-class activities before they come to class. And you can think about a flipped classroom be have, being in three parts. Okay? The first part is having them do some kind of coverage activity. So, I think it was Emily who said one of the most important things for student learning is for students to have, or the amount of prior knowledge that students have. So in a flipped classroom, the reason that you're having them build up understanding before they come to class is to pump up that prior knowledge. Okay? This, what happens here can be anything. And it doesn't have to be you making your own videos. That's another misconception about flipped classrooms. Okay, I don't have time to make my own videos. Okay? If you do, great. It takes a really long time to make a one minute video. Um, so, most of the content that I use for my students is curated content that I've selected, that I've curated myself. It can be a video, it can be you lecturing, it can be someone else lecturing, it can be a reading. Maybe you want to have them go and do an observation if you're an architect. I know some folks who flip their classroom in architecture have students go and do observations as their pre-class work. It can be anything. The idea is to have a coverage activity that builds up some of that prior knowledge so when they get to, when they get to the during class time, which is the second part of a flipped classroom, Students are prepared to work on applying the key concepts or ideas that they covered in their out-of-class work. They interact with their peers and their instructors during class time. So that's the second part. Almost every version of a flipped classroom that I've ever heard stops there. Okay? But there's a third part that's really important to flipped classrooms or to an effective flipped classroom. And that is the after class. The cycle completes in a flipped classroom when students use the feedback that they've gained from that interaction with their, with their faculty and one another to continue their learning, okay, by reviewing concepts that they found difficult, confusing, or interesting that, were, that was elicited during that in-class interaction, okay? So that is what a flipped classroom is. It's not new. It's, there's not one right way to do it. It doesn't mean having homework, having students do watch your lecture videos outside of class. It's really a three-part process to maximize students' learning. And I have a version of Bloom's Taxonomy also that looks a little bit differently than the ones you've seen today, but it has the same basic idea. In a traditional classroom, basically what we are doing during class what we're having students do during class is that we're delivering content to them, okay? And they're supposed to remember and understand and make sense of what we've said. Then we send them out of class to do the harder parts, the applying with their homework, the analyzing, evaluating, creating. We send them to do that outside of class. But that's the hard part, okay? That's the easy part. The hard, the, the, this is the easy part, the remembering and the understanding, the, the work is the hard part. So what all we're asking you to do in a flipped class is to reverse that so that they're doing the easier part by themselves without the support of their peers or their teachers and doing the hard part in class with the support of peers and teachers. Okay? And you do not have to do this every class period. You do not have to do this with every topic. There's mixed debate on this. I, I tried when I first tr did my flipped class I started with two topics and I taught the rest traditionally. 
And then last year I started teaching a new class and I went crazy and I, I did the whole thing from scratch and I don't recommend that. <laughs> so how do you pick? Pick the things that are the hardest for your students to learn or the hardest for you to teach. Pick something, a concept, that is the hardest for you to teach or the hardest for your students to learn. And just start with that one. And just like you started to draw a picture of your neighbor and maybe scratch it out and redid it, or you handed it to them and you know you'd do it differently next time, that's exactly what you'd be doing, what you'll be doing as you start rethinking your course design. Okay, so you're trying to, once we, once we do go from this arrangement, the traditional arrangement, to a more flipped arrangement, what we're doing is we're really going from here, and this is the boredom monster. I know you all know him. In fact, he's seeping in here right now. I can see him a little bit. He's that guy that comes into our classrooms, just hangs over our students' heads, okay, as we're talking. And again, notice the difference of how the room feels right now as I'm standing up here and just blathering on versus how it felt in the beginning of our conversation. We're trying to move from something that looks like this to something that looks a little bit more like this. Okay, so to close up this section of the talk, a flipped classroom is a three-part, it's a three-part approach to maximizing student learning where you have students doing some kind of coverage activity before class, some kind of hands-on application with the support of peers and instructors during class, and then continue learning after class. That's it. What you do inside those, inside that, Structure is completely up to you. So let's talk a little bit, dig a little bit deeper into these myths about flipped learning. So I've just set up the lecture as a straw man, yet I'm standing up here lecturing, okay? And personally, I love to lecture, okay? There, one big myth about flipped classrooms is that you can't lecture or that you shouldn't lecture. And I wanna relieve you of that right now. Everybody says, don't lecture. Students don't learn from lecture. Students don't learn from a 50 minute lecture where all you're doing is standing up there blathering on, okay? So just in case you don't believe me, I wanna, you know, I wanna show you what it looks like inside, inside a student's head. Haven't you always wanted to get in your student's heads? This is a study that was done out of MIT with a professor who was studying the electrodermal activity of uh, regular activities. And electrodermal activity, all that is, if we have any biologists or physiologists in the room, all it is is the temperature and the perspiration on your skin, okay? It's not a measure of your neural activity, but it's a proxy for it because it's a proxy for your central nervous system. So what this professor did is she put these little bracelets on her students who volunteered, and she followed them throughout their day at MIT. So this is one, an N of one. And here you can see when he's in lab, he's really, really active. When he's watching TV, he sort of flatlines, <laughs> okay? When he's studying, he's more active, again, flatline. Now chores looks a lot like TV. So this is an MIT undergrad. He's quite active during the sleeping hours. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of things we could guess that he's doing during that time. But you can see here's his sleeping hours. Now let's take a look at what happens when he goes to class. And remember, this is a seven-day series. Yeah. So what does, what does being in class look most like? So some people said sleep, and I like to say, actually, he's more awake when he's asleep than when he's in class. <laughs> Okay, it looks most like TV, okay? When we're watching TV or when we're listening, we're, our, our working memory, our working memory is at capacity. Working memory, our working memory has a very limited space, okay? Our long-term memory has an almost infinite, infinite amount of space, even if it doesn't feel that way. But our short-term memory has only a limited amount of space, our working memory, only a limited amount of space. So when we have stuff that's coming at us, direct instruction coming at us, like you have right now, 
Okay? It's very, your brain just sort of goes into a meditative state. It's very hard for you to do two things at once, although some of you are, which is totally fine by me. I figure if I can't capture your attention, then that's on me. Okay? So, <clears throat> what I like to say is that this is the brain on a traditional classroom. <laughs> now, I'm not saying don't lecture. In fact, lecture is a comfort blanket for students. <laughs> and if you rip that away too fast, you will lose them. They think they are coming to university and they are paying you to teach them. They do not think they are coming to university to work with their peers or to have you sit back while they build something. Okay? So if you just rip that comfort blanket away, you will lose them. <laughs> and I'll tell you another little secret. Lecture is a comfort blanket for us. And if you, someone tries to rip it away from us, we're going to dig our heels in. This is what we were born to do. Okay? So don't get rid of lecture. All I want you to do is to chunk it up. Just chunk it up. You're going to see that we're going to move in chunks throughout the rest of this session. Now, I've put 12.5 minutes there. I think that's the, the, the most. That's about, we've been going about 10 minutes now. I think that's the most anyone can really tolerate. Okay, I try to do five to seven minutes usually. This doesn't matter as long as there's some chunks there to give people a break. You can even do something as simple as, well that's the next question, what I do in between these chunks. You can just say, oh, okay, take a minute and write down anything you found confusing or write down anything you disagree with about what I just said and give them a minute. That's called the pause method to think about it and then keep going. As simple as that, doesn't require any technology whatsoever. But I'm gonna now do a demo of my favorite thing to do in between those chunks. Thermal expansion. So now everybody got a copy of my paper on thermal expansion, so you, did everybody do the reading for that? <laughs> totally kidding. Okay, so because there was no pre-class activity on this, I have to give a little lecture. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little lecture on thermal expansion now. So why is thermal expansion important? Well, if, if scientists don't think about thermal expansion, this kind of thing happens. All thermal expansion is, is uh, we're going to talk about thermal expansion in metals right now. When you heat metals up, they expand. That's the concept. When you heat metals up, they expand. These engineers, when they laid this track, did not think about that concept. Okay, so the, the tracks got hot and they expanded. Now, any East Coasters here who used to ride trains a lot? Okay, so when you're from the East Coast and you ride a train, you hear click, 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 click. That's the spaces that the engineers had left so that the metal doesn't expand and the train go off the track. Okay, so that's why the concept is important. When you heat metals up, they expand. So let me dig a little bit deeper into that. A piece of metal is made up of a bunch of little metal atoms, okay? And how temperature works is that when atoms are in metal are cool, they're vibrating very slowly. Okay, where's my chemists? Do I have a chemist in here? Oh, thank God. Oh, no. <laughs> so the chemists are going to get me on this, but I'll just say I know in advance, okay? So when the metals, they're watching me like hawks over here. I could feel it burning into me. When, when atoms are cold, they're kind of just vibrating very slowly. When, when you heat them up, they're starting to vibrate really, really fast. That's actually what a measure of temperature is. Okay? They don't want to be close together when they're hot. When they're cold, they don't care. But when they're hot, they do not want to be close together. Okay, so it kind of looks like something like this. Hot, cold. Okay? So I'm going to have you guys do a poll now. It's called the peer instruction, active learning, peer instruction poll. I want you to consider an alum aluminum chemist's aluminum plate. Nobody else cares, but after doing this 100 times, I know I have to put aluminum there in case there's any chemists in the room. <laughs> consider a metal aluminum plate with a hole in it. When you heat this up uniformly, what happens to the diameter of the hole? 
Now, I don't want you to talk to anybody. I want you to answer on your own. And if you need help, the poll is up and live. If you need help, raise your hand. Again, the poll is at active learning peer instruction. It's the second poll. And if you don't have the screen open or you, uh, you don't, you're not able to do that, just jot down your answer on your piece of paper. No talking to your neighbors unless you're helping them. Not with the answer, though. Just the first one. My classroom, no matter what I'm doing, I have a glitch. Okay, so this is the A increases is your finger one. B is stays the same, and C is decreases. When I count to count of three, I want you to put it on your chest what you think the answer is. Don't have somebody always holding their hand up like this. Okay? Just put your answer one, two, three. Okay? So on the count of three, three, two, one. What's your answer? Okay, so I see, I see some people like they don't want to say, so they're putting five. <laughs> okay, so I've got a couple twos and a couple threes. Let's move on to the next topic. Well, this is a talk about pedagogy, not about physics. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you the answer. I'll tell you the answer. Don't worry. But the point here, again, is to feel the difference in the room. Okay. I know and I hear this all the time and I feel your pain. Okay. That you need, that you are seek and you desire, you have a moral, a moral compass telling you that you need to make your content relevant to your students. That it has to be practical. How the hell are you supposed to make uh, differential equations practical to your students? Or some crazy abstract concept. Some of us just can't do that. Okay? You don't, it doesn't have to be that the content has to be relevant to every single one of your students' lives. But if you ask questions that engage them, they don't have to care about it. Just like you probably could care less about thermal expansion. But you want to know the answer right now. Now what would have happened if I just told you what happens when you heat metal up? Right? Because you would be repeating verbatim what I told you. That's a verbatim question. But I asked you a different question. I asked you to apply your knowledge, which is a much harder question. I know what you're thinking. Shut up and tell you the answer. <laughs> okay, so the correct answer is it increases. So can I get somebody who picked can I get somebody who picked C? So tell me why you picked C. Yeah, of course. But the reason might be right. Okay, my thinking was that the metal would expand in all directions equally and therefore might close up the round part of the So heart. just say the first part. My thinking was that the metal would expand in all directions. Yes. Correct. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where I would stop. But yes. So but that's there's so there's there's a misconception there, and this is where it starts to get really interesting is when you can actually elicit your students' misconceptions. Only then can you confront them. I could not confront this misconception if I, misconception if I had just asked this question. Okay? There's a misconception that the metals will behave differently when they push towards the center of the hole. Because if they push towards the center of the hole, so you've got, she's got the first half of it right. It's going to expand in all directions. If it pushes to the center of the hole, they're going to be close together and they don't want to be close together. Right. Did anybody pick B stays the same? And what was your reasoning there, if you are willing to share? Well, it has more to do with architecture from looking at uh, domes and bridges that they want to maintain themselves. Okay, so, that, so usually the misconception on this is that 
things will, uh, that they will move at the same rate and that they will cancel each other out. Okay, so we can address that as well. And uh, what about A, that it increases? Who picked A? Can I get A? I saw, I saw that she picked A, and I heard her trying to argue. Well, I picked A, and then I talked myself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we weren't sure is if the guys, so we were thinking the guys on the perimeter of the hole might move in, but most of them are not on the perimeter of the hole, and they're going to want to move out. And so the net is going to be a gain in the size of the hole. But then we were like, well, maybe 50% of them are moving in, and not a 50% are moving out, and that would make it stay the same. And then we came up with the wrong answer, so that's scary. So, but that probably wouldn't, won't happen to her the next time you do this, okay? If she's in the same group, she's gonna be less likely to let her neighbors convince her, and she'll probably push on her answer harder next time. And that's what this kind of, this, this kind of experience really gets the entire classroom engaged, not just that annoying student, I was totally this person who was always raising their hand to give the right answer, okay? This engages everybody and allows everyone to interact. This is called peer instruction. I just wanted to ask how confident you are that's the right answer. That's a great question. So, <laughs> I mean, are there empirical evidence? Has this been done yes. So Greg is asking how confident I am that this is the right answer. I am 100% confident that this is the right answer. If I had a uh, demo, I would show you. Think about what you do when you have a metal uh, lid on a jar. What do you do to get that off? Someone's like, I'll whack it across the counter, break it. <laughs> what, do some, what, what do other people do? You run it under hot water. Okay, you run it under hot water, that expands the aluminum or the metal of it, which makes space so that you can twist it off. But if I could do an actual demo, I would show you. Okay, typically people do this demo with a, um, with a cone and they lay the plate over the cone and then they heat it up and it's, it doesn't slide all the way down when they heat it up, it slides all the way down. You still wouldn't believe me though, maybe if even I showed you. Okay, but this is a talk about pedagogy. I'm happy to continue this conversation later. This is called peer instruction. It was developed in the 1990s by Eric Mazur at Harvard University. It's currently used all over the world uh, in all different kinds of disciplines. If you're wondering if you can only do this where there's a right or wrong answer, that's, you, we, if we had more time, we'd do a demo with one that was more opinion-based. It can be used in any discipline. It is used in any discipline at any grade level. Um, the basic process is you give a mini lecture. And mine was about two minutes. And then you pose a question. Now, that question again, you want to have it not be a really easy verbatim question, but a question that really requires students to think. And then let them think on their own first and then respond and then finally discuss. Now remember that I said find someone with a different answer. What will happen if you don't have them find, if they are just, you have to say turn to your neighbor and discuss. This is what will happen. Would you get A? Would you get A? Would you do last night? <laughs> that what's what will happen if they talk to someone with the right answer. So you definitely want to pair them with someone who has a different answer, okay? Have them discuss, and then re-respond, and then explain. Now, this explanation part, if you don't have time, skip the rationales. I always like to, if, when I have time, have students tell me their rationales, I always reveal the right answer first. Because what would have I happened if I said, who picked C? Oh, you picked C? Tell me why you picked C. And then I said, wrong. I would have totally embarrassed her, okay? So then that would, will happen to students. Maybe graduate students, you can, well, maybe not, that's worse. Um, I always give the reveal first, and then I ask for rationales, and that gives me the opportunity to then dig into the misconceptions. But you can also just wrap it up yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to do a long to-do. Uh, don't skip any of these steps in peer instruction. Uh, 
they're all important, but what you do within those steps has a lot of flexibility. So there's a lot of research to support peer instruction, like I said, 20 years behind it. I'm going to show you two slides that are, are very technical, but I'll explain them as uh, simply as I can. Here we looked at students' uh, probability of dropping a science course in a traditional class versus a class taught with peer instruction. So in the traditional class, you can see that they were much more likely to drop out than the students who are in the peer instruction class. And those are for freshmen. So then being taught in an interactive way, what you can take away from this slide, is really important for first year students if you want them to stay in science, if you're a science teacher. For upper class, the fit held as well, but uh, it wasn't as powerful as it was for freshmen. So maybe you think this only would work at Harvard. So we did a study in the Missouri group where we compared the uh, student performance on a, a standardized test at Harvard and then at a community college. The students you can see who are in the traditional class only gained about 30%. The students who are in the peer instruction class at Harvard gained 50%. And the same held true. They did a little bit better. Uh, they gained a little bit better in the traditional class at the um, John Abbott College but the proportion of students who did better in the peer instruction class was much higher. So what you can, this is a standardized test called the force concept inventory that's very validated in physics. So it definitely, this kind of method works no matter what type of institution that you're teaching at. So as promised, I'm going to give you a 30 second pause to think about this stuff and just leave you with the myth that you, get rid of that myth that you can't lecture and just chunk your lectures. And I've given you my favorite thing to do, but you can really do anything in those chunks. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a 30 second pause before I move on to the next section where we talk about myth two. So the second myth is that a flipped classroom is just having students watch videos out of class and do homework in class. This is probably my biggest pain point for students. Why do some of my students study so hard and they come to me and they say, Professor Shell, I studied for three hours for this test. Or I studied for five hours. I knew all the material. And then they get to the test and they don't do well. This is my biggest nightmare. This is what keeps me up at night. I hate the students who have the most potential and who work the hardest who, who truly in their hearts are trying and who don't succeed. So why do students study so hard and fail to remember what they learn? Well, to dig into this a little bit, I'm gonna put up an excerpt for you to study on the screen. Okay, and it, the print might be a little bit small, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. Okay, I want you to study this excerpt as if you were going to have a test on it, which you may. That's too small? Okay, so I'll read the first paragraph and we'll just go with that. This Basenji, known as the African barkless dog, is considered by its devotees as, a un as unique to the species. One of the oldest breeds, Basenji type dogs, are depicted in the tombs of the pharaohs and date back to as early as 3600 BC. Small and short haired, with a foxy face, worried look looking wrinkled brow, upright ears and tail, curled like a donut. The Basenji's most unusual characteristic is that it does not bark. He is, however, not mute, and although usually quiet, has a repertoire of sounds that range from a pleased throaty crow to a, a screaming wail when he is lonely or unhappy. Okay? So what do you need to do to learn this? I'm gonna give you a test on it. What are you doing? Did anyone take notes or did you just listen? Okay, so you know it? Okay, so if you were continuing on, most of you and most students, what you would do is, you would what? Take notes. Take notes. Highlight. highlight, what would you highlight probably? Facts, Facts like what? So what stood out to you? No bark. No bark, 
No. You know that though. Donut, <laughs> donut shape tape tail, oldest breed. Pharaohs had them. Okay. So you would highlight, you would scribble, you would make notes on the side, right? You'd probably reread it a couple times. That's what most people would do. What this is called is maintenance rehearsal. And this is the typical approach that everyone, almost everyone takes to studying. It's a learning strategy that involves rehearsing or repeating without making connections or meaning. Now, if you had some more time, and I gave you, let's say, an hour to study this, you might start making connections, like, oh, some of you made the connection, that doesn't bark, most other dogs bark. Okay, that's some meaning making there. Okay, so if I gave you more time, you might start to elaborate. But for the most part, students are just doing maintenance rehearsal. Reviewing, reading, studying. Elaborative rehearsal takes it up a notch, that's basically making meaning and connection between the item and something that they already know. It's basically if you think about what you know and then you're studying something, you're adding to it. That's elaborative rehearsal. But that's not actually, despite it being the way that we all study and we all learn, it's not actually the best way to do it. There's a better way. And that's called retrieval practice. Retrieval practice is the act of actually retrieving information from memory versus reviewing, rereading, or listening to it. Now, I engaged you in an act of retrieval practice by asking you what you remembered from the article, but it wasn't in front of you. Retrieval practice has exceptionally robust effects on retention, and specifically long-term retention, as well as the ability to transfer knowledge across contexts. So you'll have this, I don't expect you to read this, I'm just showing you the name of this article. When you have these slides, you'll, you're, you can look up this article if you're interested in learning more. Um, I'm gonna do this again. One time I was giving a talk in Brazil and I did, I did something like that and split my pants in front of 400 people, so <laughs> luckily I was okay there. Um, See, I, I wasn't sure you really wanted me to be on recorded, Carrie. But, uh, so in this study, students studied the text in a single study period, just like we just did without the retrieval. They did a repeated study condition where they studied the text in four consecutive study periods. And then they did an elaborative study session where they did concept maps. We all know what concept maps are where you have two or three different concepts and then you draw connections and make meeting together. And then in the retrieval practice, they read and then they did a free write, writing down everything that they could remember. And they did, the total amount of learning time was exactly matched, so it's not that these students had more time to learn than these students in both of these sections. And as you can see, one week later, on a test uh, a, a week later, the students who were engaged in the retrieval practice did better. Okay, so that's verbatim questions, right? So that, maybe that makes sense. If you're looking for verb, and all a verbatim question is, is it, it doesn't mean that the questions are the same. It means that the knowledge was verbatim in, the, in whatever they reviewed. So that Basenjis don't bark, that's a verbatim question, okay? So what about for questions that require inference, kind of like that metal plate question that we did? Well, again, the retrieval practice students did significantly better than the students in the other study groups. Substantially better than the students who did the traditional approach to studying. But what's most fascinating about this study, what really hit home for me, is that when you ask students to predict how well they were going to do, the students in the study session predicted that they would do the best, but they actually did the worst. So that question of why do so many students try so hard but not succeed, I want to suggest that one possibility among many is that they aren't studying effectively and they don't even know it. And we don't even know it. So I'm going to use this, uh, this is another article, The Critical Role of Retrieval Practice and Long-Term Retention, to walk you through what, 
what this looks like. So how would you set up retrieval practice in your own class? The first is just identify a body of content. And I'm gonna give you a layman's example of how this is working in the New York Times. Does anyone take or read Gretchen Reynolds' well column in the New York Times? So Gretchen Reynolds has a wellness column in the Times, and they have set up in the Times this content about health and wellness. So here they've written an article, treadmill may be riskiest machine, but injuries from it are still rare. Another article that week, an unexpected death rattles the fitness community. So these are two examples of content that the New York Times is, is showing their readers. Then what the Times is doing is that they're identifying what they want to stick. They're there's a lot of text in those articles, but there's certain things that the New York Times wants their readers to remember. They engage then their readers in retrieval practice. They put the weekly health quiz. So here's an example of the retrieval practice from the New York Times on that first article. Warning signs of possible heart problems during exercise include shortness of breath, numbness or tingling of the arm or jaw, feeling more tired than usual, or all of the above. What's the answer? All of the above. Now they didn't pick what is the name of the guy who fell off the treadmill. We love those kinds of questions. I know, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna see if they did their reading. I'm gonna ask them the name of the guy that fell off the treadmill. Okay. They don't do, don't do that because this is such a powerful effect. This is what they are going to remember. So you might be wondering, is one retrieval enough? Or do they need to do more than one retrieval? One retrieval is enough. But if you do more than one retrieval, it's even better, almost double better. Okay, The more retrieval, the better. But one is at least enough. The next thing that the Times does is that they provide a mechanism for feedback. So here I picked the wrong answer. I selected shortness of breath and immediately tells me whether I'm right or wrong. Immediately. So any feedback is good. This is immediate feedback. There's two types of feedback, immediate feedback and delayed feedback. Any feedback is good, but delayed feedback may have a more powerful effect than immediate feedback. So how long does the delay need to be? Um, so if you look here, we've got a student who took a test, who didn't take a test, and then um, did a final exam. This is a pretest. And then a test where there was no feedback, and then a test with immediate feedback, and test with delayed feedback. Okay? And let me explain this a little bit. The test is the retrieval practice, and then this is a separate final test that they took. So with no, no uh, pretest and no feedback, they didn't do very well in the final exam. With no feedback but, a pre, but some retrieval practice, they did okay. And then with immediate feedback, they did even better. The best they did was when the, the feedback was delayed. So what does the delay need to be? As short as six minutes, as short as six, five or six minutes is a good amount of delay. But again, any feedback is good. So if it can be immediate, that's fine. You just want to give some feedback. If you can make it delayed, great. If you can't, go with immediate. Give them some kind of feedback. Now, we're get, the New York Times is pretty impressive because I don't, I don't know if they know what they're doing. Well, it's pretty obvious to me that they're actually using cognitive science to engage with their readers. They're also even more sophisticated than just the test and the feedback. They're also using what's called spacing. So with spacing, most students don't engage in spacing. What do they do? They cram. So they study for a five hour period the day before the test. Spacing would mean studying for two hours on Monday, two hours on Wednesday, an hour on Thursday. Same amount of time, but it's spaced out over the week versus just five hours before the test. So the New York Times spaces their content and then they give the quiz. So there's a spaced retrieval in this exercise as well. Spacing, students who uh, are, have spaced retrieval perform better. These are students who were in spaced uh, retrieval practice environment are the red bars. And the first bar here 
is retention after one week, and this is retention after 25 minutes. Okay, so clearly they remember more, both, both conditions remember more after 25 minutes. But after a week, the students who engaged in the spaced practice remembered more. Okay? So again, all spacing is, is not cramming. Yeah, absolutely, and I would actually say do both these things in that case. This, the last thing, it's got this fancy word, interleaving. Interleave the practice. Okay, so here what the New York Times does is they put different content in one quiz, and that's interleaving.